around the valley. I uh, graduated from La Gurria High School in 2011. I did my undergraduate studies here at Texas A&M University, Kingsville, uh, where I got a Bachelor of Science in uh, Biomedical Sciences with a minor in Chemistry. And I'm currently in my second year of OC school. Um, I am uh, currently, I'm an intern for HEB. Uh, I work at the pharmacy there in Rio Grande City. Um, and uh, as a P2 student, and my P2 meaning my second year of pharmacy school, I, uh, every Friday I go to rotation um, in Hardingen, where I'm an uh, intern there at a hospital. Um, fortunately, that's not paid for, but you just got to do it. <laughs> um, so I'm currently gaining experience in the workforce as long as, uh, as well as with my classroom settings, uh, you know, Monday through Thursday. Here, let me welcome them. Hi, Ms. Portillo, how are you doing? Hi, Westlaco High School, how are you guys doing? It's good to see you again. Um, I want to let you know that our guest right now is Sergio Garcia, and he's a, hi guys, I can see you better now. He's a um, pharmacy student at the Herma Rangel Pharmacy School in Kingsville, and he's just barely started, so let us know if you have any questions, okay? Go ahead, Sergio. <clears throat> um, yeah, so like I was saying uh, before you all chimed in, I'm from Rio Grande City. Um, I graduated from La Gloria High School in 2011. I did my undergraduate studies here at Texas A&M University, Kingsville, where I completed my Bachelor of Science degree in Biomedical Sciences with a minor in Chemistry in three years. And I am currently in my second year of pharmacy school. Um, so how I got here, um, it's kind of interesting. I never pictured myself as wanting to be a pharmacist or anything like that. When I was in high school, I wanted to be an engineer. Um, math was my, was my favorite subject. I, I love numbers. It was very, uh, it was like common sense to me. Um, and I don't know, I just had a sudden change of heart. Uh, my father passed away when I was 11 years old from kidney failure. Uh, his kidneys failed, uh, when I was born, he had a kidney transplant and, um, kidney transplant lasted him about nine years and then he was on two years on what's called dialysis what patients without uh, kidneys have to go through and unfortunately he, he passed away two years after that and so um, you know usually patients when they have any type of organ failure they have to be put on medications um, because when they get a transplant the the organ that was transplanted to them it's not part of their body right so it seems like a foreign matter to it and so the, the body wants to try to fight that, that, that organ and wants to kill it because it's, it's not part of yourself. And so they have to put you on a lot of drugs that's going to stop your body from doing that. And so growing up, you know, I see, would see my dad take 10, 15 pills a day. Uh, it's crazy how, you know, but how much medications he was taking. And really that's what prolonged his life. That's what made him live those extra 11 years after his kidneys first failed. And that's what gave me the opportunity to get to know my dad for those 11 years that, that I spent with him to build those lifelong memories. And, um, you know, when I was getting ready to graduate, I figured, you know, there were so many doctors and pharmacists and other healthcare professionals that gave me happiness. And I want to give that back to my community. And so that's what made me change my mind into going to the pharmacy field. Um, I went to Texas A&M University, Kingsville, because they had the pharmacy school right here in Kingsville. Now, the pharmacy school is not under Texas A&M University, Kingsville. It's under Texas A&M University. We are Aggies. So when we graduate, we get that pretty nice Aggie ring. Uh, you know, we get all those perks and whatnot. Um, but it is associated with the school. It's nice that, so every pharmacy school you apply to, they have certain requirements, certain classes that you need to take before you can even apply to that school. And because the school is here in Texas A&M University, Kingsville, they work together into uh, allowing that whatever like pre-med or pre-pharmacy classes you take in, in Texas A&M University, Kingsville, correlates with the classes that you need for the pharmacy school here. So that worked out pretty well. Um, they also have, like, uh, I was part of the Pre-Pharmacy Association. 
and they kind of just get you out there, get you exposed to the school, um, let you see what's happening there, and uh, kind of prepare you. Uh, they tell you what you should be doing, as in what classes you should be taking, what teachers you should be taking, what uh, what you should use to prepare for your for your uh, PCAT test, which you need to get into pharmacy school. And so that's pretty beneficial. Um, a lot of people don't know this. This is actually a new feature that just started with my class is that there's 88 students here in Kingsville and we have 33 classmates in College Station. And so every day, uh, us 87 students are here in Kingsville. Those 33 students are in College Station and we're all interconnected um, by internet. So we have a professor that's lecturing and if they're in Kingsville, we see them you know, live and they see them through the computer. And vice versa, if they're in college station, we see them on the computer and they see them live. And so that's pretty cool for those students that ended up going over there because they get to see all the Aggie games. They get to experience the full Aggie life, which is, I guess, pretty nice. I mean, I can't speak for it since I'm here in Kingsville. But um, a lot of different opportunities. So that's now 120 students that get accepted into our pharmacy school every year. Um, it's not easy to get into the course. Of course, um, Pharmacy isn't an easy subject. You have, a have, you have to have a passion for math and science. Those are the big things. Um, you don't have to be a genius, but it, it, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, I wasn't the smartest kid in my class in high school. I wasn't the smartest kid in college, but I worked hard. You know, it just comes into putting the, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And so, um, it's really just a matter of how bad you you want you know to succeed in life. Um, I've kind of been going on for a good amount of time. Is there any questions up to this point? Let me open up some microphones. Hi, Mr. Phoenix class. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, Does anyone have any questions? Uh, not, right now. Uh, no. not now. Not yet. Okay. Do you see the chat area where you can ask questions? It's down here. Okay, good. I'm going to go to a different class. Yeah, and if you have listen. any questions, put them there, okay? Instead of, and then they can answer. Right. Yes. Claudia. Hi, Ms. Perthea's class. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Does anyone have any questions? No. Not yet. Okay. You see the chat area. If you have any questions, go ahead and put it down there, okay? Thank you. And then I also want to say hello to two that are just here on audio, Mr. Padilla's class. I understand you're working on an assignment. And Ms. Villarreal's class. Um, if you guys have any questions, there's a chat area. Just put the questions there. So, uh, Mr. Garcia, tell us a little bit about um, your undergraduate work. And what I know you were talking about math and science and that you like it, but it was hard. But can you tell us a little bit more about going to Texas, uh, the Texas A&M and Kingsville? Um, well, Texas A&M, Kingsville, okay, this is kind of, it's kind of sad. But the reason, the main reason I went to Texas A&M University, Kingsville, was because it was the only college at the time that didn't require an essay. And so I was a little lazy my senior year, so I, I went that route, uh, which I could have gone anywhere. I was top 10 in my class, so I would have been automatically accepted anywhere. But I'm, 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 kind of, I'm kind of a mama's boy, so I like being close to home. Uh, I, when I was an undergrad, I would go home every weekend. Um, so it's far enough to where you can get away, but close enough to where if anything happened, you know, I could go back home uh, without any issues. Um, and so I took the biomedical sciences route uh, because it entails a lot of classes such as biology, um, genetics. Uh, those are the major courses, all those sciences. You go into anatomy and physiology, stuff like that. And then I minored in chemistry, uh, which have your basic inorganic chemistries. And then you go into things like your organic chemistries and your biomedical uh, chemistries. And... Um, those, those were suggested to me to be uh, 
the the class that would classes that would prepare you the most for pharmacy school. In pharmacy school, um, you focus a lot on the anatomy of the body. You have to understand how the body works. You need the fundamentals, and then you need to understand how the body's going to react to drugs and stuff like that. And the drugs, that's all chemistry. You need to know these structures and stuff like that um, to understand how they're going to behave. Of course, I can't, I can't draw every single drug structure for you. I, I probably couldn't even draw one whole drug structure. You don't need to be that smart to, to be a pharmacist. Uh, but it's just a, a basic understanding, basically. Uh, but you don't have to go into that route uh, in undergrad to get into pharmacy school. You want to, to be a strong candidate for pharmacy school, you need to find a way to make yourself stand out. So a lot of people are going to do, are going to major in biology. They're going to major in chemistry uh, and stuff like that. You know, nutrition, you would think, what does nutrition have to do with pharmacy? But nutrition, they're actually very well trained in chemistry and they do understand a lot of biology. And so that is something, you know, a small little thing that could separate you from the majority of applicants uh, applying into pharmacy school. It's just a little different that's going to make you stand out, yet you will still be prepared um, to, to handle the courses in pharmacy school. Um, of course, to get into pharmacy school, you need a certain GPA. Every school has a minimum GPA that you need to have uh, through undergrad. And like I was saying earlier, every school has their prerequisites. And so at this point of time, you don't need a bachelor's degree to get into pharmacy school. You just need those prerequisites, which usually takes uh, approximately about two years. You could get into pharmacy school um, and, and start off early. You don't need a bachelor's degree. Uh, one of my buddies, who's he's a year over me, we, we graduated high school together together. Um, and he was able to get in within two years. And so he's ahead of me. He doesn't have a bachelor's degree, but he's going to be out helping people and making money before I am. So it's just a matter of, of uh, how prepared you can be, you know, when it comes to application time. Um, you also take a test called the PCAT. It's very similar to the SAT or the ACT. It's a time test, computerized, and it tests you on subjects of biology, chemistry, uh, uh, reading, writing, uh, and mathematics. So you'll have your geometry, trigonometry, and calculus associated with that test. And it's a time test. I, I, it's been a while. I think it was like five hours, six hours. You're just there sitting in front of a computer. You take the test, and then you get your score. You get a preliminary score. It's not your exact score, but it's around the ball, ballpark of what you got. And uh, most schools, they have a minimum score of what you need on that um, to get. And so um, those are the main, the main um, really what they're going to look at is your GPA and that PCAT score. Um, other things that, that, you know, schools look at is uh, community service or volunteer work. You know, if you can, I know some schools, I don't know if all high schools offer this, but they offer a program where um, – you can get your pharmacy technician license. And when, when you graduate high school, I think it is, you, you take that license, uh, you take that test and you become a, a technician and you can work at a pharmacy and get that early exposure. Um, that's one thing that I wish I would have had coming in pharmacy school. Uh, I had never stepped inside of a pharmacy, uh, inside of a pharmacy until this summer when I started working. And so uh, in the first year, they focus a lot on, at least in our school, they focus a lot on the top 200 drugs, uh, mm -hmm. what they are, what the brand name is, what the generic name is, and what are they used for. And um, drug names is like a completely different language. Mm -hmm. It's tough trying to learn all these different drugs. And so if you can get that exposure, that experience inside of a pharmacy, uh, that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do better, but it's going to make it a lot easier uh, for your first year. Um, and, you know, gaining all these volunteer hours and, 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 um, you know, extra stuff like that, that comes with joining organizations in college. You know, when you get into college, don't just, you know, stay in your room and study all day. You know, you need to get out there. You need to, you know, relax sometimes, you know, you need to associate with other people. 
And so joining, you know, I was in, in, in the pre-pharmacy association. I was in uh, a SNAFA, which is Student National Pharmacy Association. I was in uh, another one. I think it was called like American Medical Student Association or something like that. It doesn't matter what the names of them are. The, the point is to join them. And that's how you're going to get all these, you know, different volunteer hours, stuff like that. You get to know people. You get to make connections. And that in turn will, you know, only push you further into um, gaining into these, you know, uh, graduate programs. Um, I see I had a question earlier here from David Padilla asking, how many years of school do I have left? Uh, after pharmacy school in total is four years. So I'm in my second year. And so the way uh, pharmacy school works is you do your three, three years in the actual classroom. And then your fourth year, you're out on rotations. You do six different rotations. Each rotation is six weeks long. And so you'll do a rotation at, at a community pharmacy, which is like HEB, Walmart, or any independent pharmacy. You'll do another one at a hospital uh, where you're working with the staff pharmacist there. And then you have your electives where you can work with pediatrics. So you work with, with uh, babies, essentially. You can work with geriatrics, which are, are the elderly. You can work uh, oncology, which is your cancer patients. And so there's different uh, electives that you can take for your rotations. And so your fourth year, you're basically working, but instead of getting paid, you're paying the school to work. And so that's just how it is. But that's where you get the majority of your experience. And a lot of people, when they're out in the rotations, they make that connection with, with um, you know, whoever they're, they're doing the rotation with, and they have a job waiting for them uh, right when they graduate. And so... Um, I, I have two years left. I have one more year of, of my classroom time, and then I'll have my fourth year rotation. And uh, once you graduate, that doesn't mean you're automatically a pharmacist. You have a PharmD degree, but then you have to take two state board exams um, to be licensed as a pharmacist. And once you get that, that license, then you can practice pharmacy um, uh, as much as you like. Um, any other questions? Good question, Mr. Padilla's class. Let's look at some of the other classes. Um, no, no. Padilla's in Westlaco. Hi, guys. Hi. Any Where questions? No. No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We'll wait then. Just a moment. Let me mute your mic. And let's ask the, uh, Ms. Defino's class. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, any other courses that you're thinking of? Yeah, put a question. No, uh, yeah, put a question. No questions yet? Uh, yeah. 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 Not yet. Okay, um, so let's see. What else can I talk about? Um, yeah, and so in undergrad, Okay, so the main purpose that our school here, uh, the Irma Lerma Rangel College of Pharmacy, uh, the main the purpose for it being built in Kingsville was because there's such a huge lack of pharmacists in the valley, and so their main goal was to bring pharmacists down into South Texas. Um, no one wants to be in the valley for some reason. Um, and so they built the school here in Kingsville to attract more, more people from, from the Valley in South Texas, hoping that they would stay. And even at that point, the majority of my classroom and the other classes, they're all from Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and they do not want to come to the Valley. They're terrified of the Valley. They think people are chopping heads down here. I don't know for what reason, but, um, so that's one of the big things that, that pushed me in the door. Um, I'm Hispanic. I'm from the Valley. I plan to come back to the Valley and I can speak Spanish, of course. Um, so my, so for our school, I, I believe the minimum GPA was like maybe a 3.2 or a 3.3. I'm not exactly sure. My GPA wasn't very high. I might've had maybe a 3.4 at, at best. I, 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 uh, didn't do extremely well in, in undergrad, which is understandable. I mean, you're coming out of high school, you got to adjust your first, you know, year or two. So not everybody's perfect. Some people adjust better than others. Um, so I didn't have the most um, uh, impressive GPA. Uh, for the PCAT, the minimum score here was a 40. And 
I scored a 54. On my second time, on my first time, it's kind of embarrassing, I scored an 18. I didn't study. I kind of just wanted to take it to see what it was about, uh, get, get that exposure. And that way, when I took it the second time, I would know what to expect. I could prepare more for it. And I got a 54, which isn't, it's not very great. You know, most, the majority of people in my class got 70s, 80s, and some even got 90s. And so, you know, knowing that information, when I, when I first started pharmacy school, I thought I was going to be one of the dumbest guys in class. You know, I thought I was going to barely be hanging on uh, to the material and stuff. But your GPA and PCAT scores, they don't mean anything really in pharmacy school. That means they mean you try really hard for that one test and you tried, you know, really hard in undergrad, but pharmacy is a different animal. You know, like I said, I was in the lower range of, of, of GPAs and PCATs and I'm, I want to say I'm probably, you know, within the top five students of my classroom because I'm now dedicated, I'm mature and I've, I've kind of, I didn't know how to study until I got into pharmacy school. And so you kind of figure things out as you go along. Um, I was speaking to a freshman who's from my hometown. He was, he's trying to get into pharmacy school or he's interested in getting into pharmacy school. And he is, uh, you know, he's, he's just a freshman in college and he got a, or he thinks he's going to get a C in political science, which is government in college. And he's saying, uh, I don't want to be a pharmacist anymore. I don't think I can do it. And it's like, I mean, first it's your first semester. You have to adjust. And then political science has nothing to do with pharmacy. So I, don't, I didn't understand why he felt that way. But I guess some people feel that, that they need to do well in every single subject in order to, to be smart enough to be a pharmacist. And the way that, that um, schools look at your GPA uh, when, you're, when you're applying uh, for the school is they, they look at your overall GPA and they take that into account, but they also look at your, your science classes and they kind of make their own GPA with your science classes alone. After all, that's your main focus. Uh, it's, it's science. And so really, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, don't be failing any other basic classes, but you know, your, your, your attention should be in the science courses. That's where, that's where the majority of, of, um, your knowledge should come from. Let me see. I see some questions down here from David Padilla. How many question was, how many prerequisite classes did I have to take? And so for, um, for my school, the minimum is 72 hours. And so, uh, let me see. Usually classes are about three hours, three credit courses. So I took, somewhere between 20 and 25 classes before I got into pharmacy school. And so what I did, you know, I, I'm kind of, I was, I was smart enough to where I could handle a big load. And so I took 18 credit hours uh, semesters when I was in undergrad and I took summers also. So I could, I just wanted to graduate really quick. I wanted to get in pharmacy school as fast as I could. Um, so yeah, about 20, 25 classes is going to be different for each school. Other schools might require a couple extra classes. And so, but for here, for the one here in Kings was so just 72 hours. Um, another question I see here is how is the pay for pharmacists? What is the cost for the PCAT or that test? Um, down here in the Valley, um, the Valley is where pharmacists get paid the most, believe it or not. Um, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, those places, there's too many pharmacists over there. There's too many schools over there. And uh, pharmacists are having a, a difficult time finding jobs over there. But here in the Valley, it's not too bad. And the pay, the pay is higher here. Usually, you're talking a, a starting salary, about 120, 130,000 a year. Um, and then a lot of companies will give bonuses and stuff like that. So it's, it's a pretty good paying career. Um, the PCAT, I think that test costs, uh, I think like $200. Um, and then when you, you pay $200 for the test, and then when you apply to the school, you pay like $150 to apply, and you pay like $50 for them to look at your application. It's, they try to squeeze out as much money as they can. 
uh, but that's when you get student loans for and pay them off when you graduate. Um, another question I see here is, why do pharmacists choose to work with companies such as HEB instead of opening their own store slash pharmacy? So right now, healthcare is kind of rough. Um, there's a lot of drugs that, um, let's say someone comes in with insurance, they, let's say they pick up metformin for diabetes, uh, it's a diabetes medication. And the patient doesn't have to pay anything because their, their insurance covers it. Their insurance pays us, let's say, $10 for 20 pills, but it costs us $15 for those 20 pills to buy. And so a lot of the times, pharmacies are losing money on these medications because um, insurance companies or Medicare, Medicaid aren't paying us what it costs, but we have these agreements with them, and so we have to take that loss. And so with companies such as HEB, Walmart, they make so much money everywhere else in other parts of the store that they can afford to take these little losses. Um, so it's, it's at this point of time, the way healthcare is, it's a little harder for independent pharmacies um, to, to keep their business going. Um, not only that, when you open up your own independent pharmacy, and it's a shame because I always dreamed about opening my own independent pharmacy. Um, but you work a lot more when you have your own pharmacy. And the reason for that is, is let's say HEB, they have all their staff pharmacists that work at their store every single day or 40 hours a week. And they have extra pharmacists, what they call floaters or as needed pharmacists. And these pharmacists, it's kind of like their side job. And so they only work when someone's absent or something like that. Or let's say they work at a hospital full time, but they still want to work more. So they work uh, these as needed jobs and they can cover for, for pharmacists that, uh, you know, are going to go out on vacation or call in sick or things like that. When you open up your independent pharmacy, it, it's tough to find someone else to come in and work for you. And so, you know, those people, they, they work like dogs and they, they can become very rich out of that. They can make a lot more money than, you know, someone else at HEB or stuff like that. I don't know. In the Valley, there's a, an independent pharmacy called Science Pharmacy. You may have heard of it, may have not. The, uh, it's a wife and a husband. They're both pharmacists and they both own, they own like seven or eight pharmacies and they are very well off. I, I spoke to, to the owner and she had told me that Walgreens wanted to buy one of her pharmacies for $1.3 million and she's turned it down because she does so well in her business. So, um, uh, it just depends, you know, on how, how, how the healthcare is at the time or how you do drugs are kind of like gas prices one day you can buy 10 bottles of metformin for for two hundred dollars the next day the price will shoot up to a thousand dollars for that same amount and so sometimes it's just luck you bought them at the right time the price goes up and you're making more money off of that sometimes you bought it at the wrong time time price goes down after you bought it and you're losing money on that so it just depends on how you manage it um Another question I see here is, what is the salary range? Um, like I said earlier, uh, you know, probably in the, you know, in, in uh, Central Texas, stuff like that, you're probably looking at about 100000 down here, starting 130000 140000 excuse me. I know, uh, well, I don't know personally, but uh, a fourth-year pharmacy student was telling me that he knows someone that just graduated uh, a couple years ago. He started working in the Valley. He was making so much money. He didn't want to be in the Valley anymore. He went to Houston and now he's making less in Houston than what he started off in the Valley. Um, I want to say HEB, I heard, I mean, I don't, I don't know for a fact, but they're starting their pharmacists off at about 140,000 a year. Um, and then every three months they get a 10% bonus. Um, so in the total year, they're making, uh, close to 160,000, maybe 155,000, somewhere in that ballpark. That's for a staff pharmacist. You could be a staff pharmacist and, um, with time you could go up to a manager pharmacist. And of course, managing pharmacists, they're not going to get a huge raise, but they do see a little bit more income. Um, I see another, uh, um, uh, Another question here asking, is having your own pharmacy 
uh, scary because of lawsuits. Really, you're going to see lawsuits um, anywhere you go. It depends on how you run the pharmacy. Uh, let's say I gave out. So, so in, in the medical field, we have what's called HIPAA, HIPAA privacy. And uh, I can't remember what, exactly what it stands for. But basically, it's that everyone's health information is protective to themselves. No one else should be able to see anyone else's uh, health care information. Uh, unless given permission by that that person, and so let's say I gave I'm working at HEB as a pharmacist, and I gave so and so's medication to the wrong person, and that person found out I gave out their medication to that person, and they want to sue me um, because I violated their privacy. I, I sh let someone else know their health information. I would be sued for that as a pharmacist. Not not the co I mean the company might be sued, but it's really um, your, your license is at stake no matter where you work, whether it be independent or, or at a retail. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it, you have a bigger chance of, of, um, having a lawsuit filed against you, whether you're at HEB or, or your own independent store. So, uh, there's that. Um, any, any other questions? Let me go to some of the schools and see if they have um, anything to say. Hi, Miss Portillo's class. How are you guys doing? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I think everyone should ask. Yeah. What, what was that? Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Thank you. Miss, Miss. <laughs> okay, go ahead and ask. What inspired him to be in the medical field? What inspired, him, what inspired him to be in the medical field? Okay. Um, so I don't think y'all uh, were tuned in when I had said this, but uh, I originally wanted to be an engineer. I was in love with, with uh, mathematics. Um, uh, I always... <laughs> hey, hey. I never... Um, he hated math or anything like that. But uh, when, I was, uh, when I was born, my, my father's kidneys failed. Um, they didn't work anymore. Uh, his sister gave him a kidney transplant. Uh, very fortunate for that. And nine years later, his kidneys failed again. Uh, usually transplants, they don't, they don't last very long. Um, two years later, he, he passed away, unfortunately. Um, and so when, when you get a, uh, any type of organ transplant, that organ is foreign to your body. Your body doesn't recognize it. So your body wants to fight it. You, it wants to kill it because your body doesn't like having things in it that that's not originally a part of it. And so they have to give you a lot of different medications to help fight that, to help stop your body from, from killing off that, that transplant. And so uh, my father was on somewhere between 10 to 15 pills taking a day. Um, and so every, every, I remember every morning I'd give my dad, he'd tell me to get him the four or five pills he had to take in the morning. And um, that really, without those medications, I wouldn't have had those. I would have never known my dad. He would have died, you know, right when I was born. And so I'm very grateful for that. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And I want to give back to my community. I know, um, and there's so many people out there, you know, I, I hear from my family all the time. You know, they don't want to see the doctor. They don't want to go find out that something's wrong with them. And they're killing themselves, basically. If they're not getting the health, uh, health um, help that they need, you know, they're slowly killing themselves. And I, I want to stop that. You know, I want, I want my friends and family to live longer, healthier lives. Um, and so really, you know, to, to want to go into the health field, you need to have a passion for, for patients. You, you need to have a passion for uh, wanting to help people out because it, if you're just doing it for the money and stuff like that, I mean, it, it, it gets tough. The, the journey to, to becoming a pharmacist, a, a doctor, a nurse, it, 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 it's hard because there's so many things you have to learn. And unless you have a passion for it, you, you're going to get tired of it really quick. And so, um, yeah, that, that's what inspired me uh, to go into the health field. Um, 
see a, a question here. Approximately how many hours do you work per week? Um, as a pharmacist, uh, you know, at HEB, Walmart, stuff like that, if you're a staff pharmacist or, or a manager pharmacist, you're going to work your 40 hours a week. Um, that's what you get paid for. Obviously, you know, there's times where the pharmacist has to come in earlier to finish things that weren't done the day before, or they have to stay later to finish things that weren't finished that day. Um, if you own your own pharmacy, you can work as much as you want. You could work 80 hour weeks. Um, but even if you don't own your own pharmacy, uh, like I was saying earlier, there's pharmacists that they have their, their, their prior, their main job where they they'll work their 40 hour weeks and they can be, they call it a PRN, PRN stands for as needed. And they can get that PRN job at a hospital or at another uh, retail store and they can work those extra hours. You know, a lot of young people, they come out, they're not married, they don't have any kids and they want money. They need to pay off their loans. And so um, they'll work, they'll work all those as needed jobs to get as much money as you can. Um, pharmacy school is expensive. Um, uh, so in undergrad, you can get things like your federal grants, uh, your Pell Grant, your Texas Grant. Uh, that's all free money by the government. When you get into pharmacy school, there's no such thing as free money. You have to apply for scholarships. You have to get grants. Um, I, I haven't applied. I've been busy. But I take out every year, I have to take out a $30,000 loan uh, for pharmacy school. Uh, it's a lot of money, but you make so much coming out that you can pay it off in no time, especially if you start working, you know, extra jobs. Um, another, another question I see here is how much money does a pharmacy tech make and how long is the schooling? Pharmacy technicians, uh, it depends. If you work at an independent pharmacy, they could start you off as little as a uh, minimum wage, I think, because they're a business. They need to keep their, their business uh, running. I think um, you can take maybe a year of classes, like at STC or UTPA or something like that. You take so many classes, and you take that, um, that exam. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a miniature PCAT, except not as hard. Um, and so long as you pass that exam, you get your license. I think at HEB, a tech probably starts out at, uh, I, I don't know exactly, I guess they start off like at $10 an hour or something like that. Um, even at that, uh, another option that, that someone uh, could, could start if maybe, you know, they don't want to be a pharmacy technician, but uh, at HEB, we have what's called PCRs. And they're the stands for a pharmacy care representative and they're the cashiers for the pharmacy. And so they don't do any technician duties. They don't really handle the drugs or anything, but they see what the drugs are. And so that's a, a little miniature exposure that you can get. Um, and you start learning what the drugs are because people come in and they say, okay, I'm here to pick up my lisinopril. And they ask, what's, what's that? What's that for? I don't know. The doctor gave it to me, but I don't even know what it's for. And so just being there, you find that out from the pharmacist, you tell that to the patient and you slowly start, you know, getting exposed little by little uh, to things like that. And to be a PCR, uh, you don't need any experience. You just, you know, apply to HUB and hopefully you can become a PCR. You don't need a, any license or anything like that. Um, how many, I, another question I see here is how many volunteer hours do you need? There's no definitive answer. I think I had four volunteer hours uh, when I came out of college. But like I said, what helps me a lot for, for Texas A&M was that I'm from the Valley, I'm Hispanic, and I want to go back to the Valley. That, that's what really makes me stand out because there's, there's no one from the Valley coming to apply to these schools, really. Um, and so, um, but of course, the more volunteer hours you have, the better it's going to look. Some schools, I believe UIW, they require at least 80 hours of shadowing at a pharmacy. Um, they're the only school that I'm aware of that, that, that requires that. Um, and so, uh, like I said, it just depends. It just depends. Um, another question I see here is, you fill prescriptions. What are some other responsibilities? So as a pharmacy, pharmacist intern, um, 
what, when I started off, like I said, I had no, I had no, um, I had no experience. So what technicians do is a, a patient comes in, they, they bring a receipt or not a receipt. I'm sorry, a prescription. Uh, and they, the, the first job to do is scan the prescription into the system. So they scan that in and then the technician uh, then has to type it in. So they look at the, the prescription, they type in all the information, type in the patient's name, um, what drug they're prescribed, what was the doctor that prescribed it, how many uh, medic, uh, pills or what's the quantity of the prescription, stuff like that. After it gets typed, um, it goes into assembly is what most places will call it. And that's where, you know, they pull the medication from the shelves. They count whatever pills or, or tablets they need. Um, they put in the bottle, place a label on it, and then it goes to the pharmacist and the pharmacist does the final verification. They look at everything that the technician did. They make sure it's the right drug, the right quantity, and they just double check that everything's right. Um, after that, whenever a, a, a patient is getting a new, a new medication that they've never had before, by law, they have to get counseled on that. They have to be told how to take the medication or they don't have to be told, but they have to be offered it. The patient can choose to, to refuse it or not. But um, the pharmacist has to tell them, you know, how to take it, if there's any drug interactions, what to do, what not to do. Um, so when I started off, I did a lot of technician duties because, you know, in the end, if you want to be managing a pharmacy, you have to know the ins and outs of your pharmacy. You have to know all the cracks and crevices and know how everything works. And so I started off with taking in those prescriptions, scanning them in, typing them up. Um, then as, as I, I got the hang of that stuff, I started doing a lot of the assembly. I started pulling the medications off the shelves, filling them, counting them. And as you're doing that, you're doing another little verification check. Um, some pharmacists don't do that at all. Uh, at my store in Rio Grande City, uh, that's the busiest HEB pharmacy in the valley. And so the pharmacist uh, is, does a lot of the counting of the pills. They assemble a lot of the medications. At other stores where it's not so busy, mainly technicians do that stuff. And so the pharmacist will just be verifying. They get everything that's ready and they just double check everything. And they're the ones doing the counseling. Um, they also, when patients come in, they, um, you know, they say, you know, I, I have this, I have this rash on my shoulders or anything I can do for that. They do those recommendations. Um, also when a doctor calls in, uh, they, a doctor can call in a prescription and the pharmacist has to take that down. Uh, or if, uh, let's say you're transferring a prescription from one pharmacy to another. The pharmacist has to do that uh, duty as well. Um, at my, at my pharmacy, the pharmacist does a lot of the, the assembling. I do that as well. That's my main duty uh, is assembling the medications. Um, that gives me a, a, it's a great way for me to get to know the medications and, and get accustomed to it. So, cause see the thing about going to school is you learn so many things and if you don't go out and practice it, you're going to forget it all, which is terrible. And so being an intern really helps you remember and retain all these things. Um, and so I do a lot of that assembling. I cannot do the final verification that's illegal. That has to be done by the pharmacist. But I do do a lot of the counseling. Um, I'm very fortunate. It depends on, so when you're an intern, you have a pharmacist assigned to you. They're called your preceptor. And they're the ones looking over you all the time. And, um, uh, I'm very fortunate that my preceptor, he treats me as the pharmacist. Whenever there's a pharmacist duty, he says, well, Sergio's the pharmacist today. He's got to do it. And so I work like a pharmacist almost all the time. And so I'm doing a lot of that, that counseling, um, and a lot of those recommendations. I do flu shots. We as pharmacists are certified to give vaccinations. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave like 20 flu shots or something like that, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, so pharmacy is moving into a whole new direction. You, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have ever heard of going to your pharmacy to get your flu shot. And so, uh, the career is, is changing. We're getting, uh, a lot more responsibilities and we're being able to do a lot more things. Uh, pretty soon I'm sure pharmacists are going to be prescribing medications and some specific, uh, uh, jobs, they do sort of prescribe medications. And so retail isn't the only option for pharmacy. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, when you work at a hospital pharmacy, you can be just a regular staff pharmacist where you're kind of just checking all the, the doctor's orders and you're getting those medications ready and those get shipped out to the patients. Or you could be a clinical pharmacist. And what clinical pharmacists do is 
uh, these guys, they go out with uh, the doctors, the nurses, and they go to the patient's rooms. They, they're there while they're doing the assessment. And the doctor looks at the pharmacist and says, okay, what do we give them? And so in that sense, the pharmacist is what really is what's prescribing the medication. And so that's another aspect. You can go into compounding pharmacy. What compounding pharmacists do is when there are certain medications that, let's say, um, um, let's say a baby or let's say a three-year-old, you know, needs Tylenol, but they can't swallow pills. Well, that can get sent to a compounding pharmacy, and they'll turn that Tylenol into a lollipop. And so compounding pharmacists make, make medications, essentially. Um, you can go into nuclear pharmacy. Nuclear pharmacists, they're the ones that make your chemotherapy drugs and those pharmacists make a lot of money. I have uh, a classmate, his father owns a nuclear pharmacy and in one day, one single day, they made $60,000 worth of profit. And so it really, the, the field, you can make whatever I, I've been told. I don't, I don't, I don't know from firsthand, obviously, but uh, one of my pharmacists that, that I worked with, he said, if you go into drug development, which are the ones that, that are, are out there, you know, testing to try to make new drugs. But, but you know, for those types of jobs, you got to be working in big cities like Dallas, stuff like that. Those guys are making well over the millions of dollars, you know, developing these drugs. So the sky's the limit when it comes to pharmacy. There's so many different jobs you can do. Um, okay, I see another question here. You don't have to read doctor's handwritings anymore. <laughs> I wish. Um, it's changing. We get a lot of electronic scripts where they're, they're practically emailed to us. So that's a lot, easy, a lot easier. But there's still uh, doctors that write like kindergartners and they bring their scripts in. Um, it's tough, but every doctor, they kind of write the same. And so you get used to it. I'm not used to it. There's a lot of times where I'm verifying these prescriptions and I got to go to a technician. I got to say, hey, what the heck does this say? I I, I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll read something like, I think it says, I don't know, let's say bed and they read like George or something like that. It's, it's crazy, but you get used to it. Um, another question I got here is what advice would you give uh, a senior high school student interested in this? Um, I'd say, you know, don't be, um, When you get into college, um, don't be afraid to, uh, I guess, try different things. You, you need to get exposed. Um, join different, if you're interested in, in healthcare profession, don't just focus on pharmacy or, 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 or doctor or nursing. You know, go to different organizations. You know, find out about different things. Um, you know, I... I I was lucky enough that when I got into pharmacy school and I started working, I liked it. But before that, I really didn't know if I was going to like it. And there's some people that they get in pharmacy school, they graduate, they go out work for a year and they don't want to do it anymore. And so really, you know, try to get that exposure to see what it's like before you, you know, go through all that trouble and then waste your time because you don't like it. Um, it's pretty important. Um, I have a buddy, he's in his third year of pharmacy school. He loves pharmacy, but he's found out that he loves, uh, he wants to be a doctor more. And so when he graduates from pharmacy school, he's going to apply to medical school. And that's another like, I don't know, eight years or something like that. And so, um, but yeah, just that, that early exposure, you know, you need to find out what you like. Um, and, and um, you know, when you get into college, don't don't let a bad bad test bog you down. Don't let it make you feel like you're not smart enough. My very first college exam that I ever took, I got a 36 um, that I didn't know what to expect. And that's that's I was ranked 10th in my high school. I thought I uh, personally I thought I was the smartest person in my high school. I got into college and I got a 36 on a political science exam. Um, it scared the crap out of me. Uh, but the, really that, that, um, that pushed me to do better, especially when I got into pharmacy school, my first year, um, like I said, I didn't really know how to study until I got into pharmacy school. And 
when I first got in my first semester, I didn't take it very serious. I would go home on the weekends and I would go hunting for Palomas all weekend long. I'd get back to Kingsville at, at 10 midnight and I'd start studying for a biochem exam the next day and I would get 70 stuff like that, which is pretty good for studying, you know, all night. Um, but I wasn't taking it serious. Um, when I started seeing how my classmates were doing so much better than me, that pushed me to, to work harder, to be more serious. And really, it's not to beat my classmates. That's not why I work as hard as I do. It's so that when I get out into the healthcare field, when I get out into to working, so I don't kill somebody. I don't accidentally cause harm to a patient because that's the worst thing. Could you imagine, um, you know, having a medication that's dosed for an adult and you accidentally give that to a child and that child dies because you didn't pay attention to school or you weren't paying attention at work. You were being careless. That it, it's tough and you're going to make mistakes. You know, in any, in any healthcare field, nobody's perfect. You're going to make mistakes, but I want to try to avoid that and minimize that as much as I can. And so I'm trying my best so I can give the best care to my patients when that time comes. Um, you know, so like I, you know, like I emphasized earlier, you really have to have that passion uh, for helping people out. Um, you know, don't, I, I really advise, I can't tell you what to do, but I really advise you don't go into this profession for the money. Sure, the money's nice. You know, I'm excited. First thing I'm going to buy when I graduate is going to be a boat so I can go fishing on South Padre. But um, uh, that's not what I'm doing it for. You know, I, 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 I have that, that desire to help people out, to help my family out. My mom, she's, she has high blood pressure. She has high cholesterol. She's had balloons done in her arteries. Um, you know, just a mess of things, you know, and, you know, every day, you know, or on the weekends I go back to, you know, see how my mom's doing. And she tells me, Oh, I forgot to take my pill this morning. Like I, you know, I get upset with her, you know, I don't want my mom to die at age 52 from a heart attack. You know, I want my mom to, to get to, you know, see my grandchildren or see her grandchildren. Um, you know, I already lost my dad because of, you know, of, of bad health. And to be honest, my dad's kidneys failed because he had very, very uncontrolled uh, high blood pressure, which can really hurt your kidneys. And uh, he, he never really saw a doctor. Um, you know, there's so many times I wish I could have, you know, I, I wasn't alive back then, but I wish someone could have done something to made him take care, better care of himself so I could have still had him here. Um, so really, you know, that, that's my biggest advice. Um, I have another question here. What are the different types of jobs in those fields? So, you know, like I said earlier, clinical pharmacy, you're there with the doctors rounding. You're recommending the medications to these sick patients. Uh, you can specialize. You can go into oncology and you're working with just on, uh, uh, cancer doctors, you know, just with cancer patients. Um, there's, um, there's different outpatient clinics. Like uh, there's what's called a warfarin clinic. Um, warfarin's a drug. It's a blood thinner used for people that they had, uh, they've had a history of stroke. And so they get put on this medication. So, so they can, um, they can stop clotting really. And this drug's very dangerous. Um, it has to be very closely monitored. If not, you can bleed to death. And so you can be, there's these warfarin clinics where patients that are on this medication, they go to this clinic and they get monitored. They make sure that their dose is right because this drug, it has, their dose has to be changed all the time because the, the effectiveness of this drug can change dramatically with, with eating things like green leafy vegetables or with taking any uh, supplements, any vitamins. And so uh, you can be a pharmacist there monitoring, monitoring these patients. Um, uh, you can go into drug development, making drugs. You can go into, uh, uh, you can be a, a pharmaceutical rep. What pharmaceutical reps are is they work with these drug companies and they give them a real nice car. They give them a lot of money. They send them to doctor's offices, take them out for a real expensive dinner and say, okay, this is why you need our drug. Um, uh, they get paid very well as well. You can work with, uh, with the Medicare part. Um, you can be behind the scenes, uh, with that stuff. Even, uh, there's, there's people that they work in poison control. And so what those pharmacists do is, um, we, we had one come speak to us the other day. 
she works she she gets she does 40 hours i mean technically she does 40 hours a week uh but she works everything in a big clump and so really she works about a third of the month because she'll work really long hours and all she does is she sits behind a, a computer waiting by a phone she says she watches netflix almost all the time until a, a, someone calls poison control saying, hey, my baby took this, you know, accidentally took five Tylenol pills, what do I do? Or you'll even have, it's pretty interesting, they say they'll have, you know, uh, drug addicts a call and say, hey, can I mix, you know, methamphetamine with, with cocaine? And, you know, and things like that. It's, it's, it's interesting, obviously, you know, the person would say, I, I'm not allowed to give information like that. But, um, you know, there's, there's, the way, there's a whole lot of different, um, different uh, aspects in, in the field. Um, any other questions? Okay, one just popped up. What about the narcotics? Those have to be under lock and key and other meds like pseudofedrin. You have to keep those locked, correct? Right. So um, drugs can be classified as a controlled substance, and you have your class C2, which, and the way they, they classify them is how likely you are to get addicted to them physically and mentally and how likely you are to abuse them. And so uh, C2 drugs, those are the most addictive and uh, most abused drugs. And so those by law have to be locked up. And there's a lot of measures that goes into making sure that no one's stealing those in the pharmacy. And so every time we count those pills, we have to count how much left in the bottle. And we have to make sure that it was the right bottle used. And there's a lot of different like little things that we have to do to make sure no one's stealing them or they're not going missing. Then there's C3 through 5. Those are still controlled substances. They do have uh, some instances of, of, of being abused or, or becoming addicted to them, but not as much as the C2s. Those, by law, do not have to be locked up, but by law, they have to be double counted all the time, and we do have to have you know, some measures to making sure that they're not being sold and stuff like that. Um, Pseudofedrin is another one. It's, uh, a lot of people use it when they have stuffy nose. That's used to make uh, meth. And so if you all have seen Breaking Bad, you know, that's what they go around buying all the time is the Sudafed. And so that's not locked up, but we do have to keep that, you know, behind the pharmacy. And when someone comes in to buy that, we have to denote that that person bought this much and they can't buy so many. They, there's a limit to how much they can buy a month. Um, and so... Um, yeah, it's you know little little measures that we go through to protecting those. I see another another um, um, question here asking, what's the hardest part of learning the drug names? The hardest part is that they 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 sound like a two year old made them up. I I read a drug the other day for a test. I have a test on Thursday, and one of the drugs I have to know is called idarucizumab or something like that uh, it's tough there's another one called abciximab it's spelled a b c i x m a b a b something like that it, it, it's i don't know who comes up with these things but it's ridiculous um so sometimes it's like how do you how do you remember this but there's a lot of tricks we use to memorizing drugs or knowing what they're for so let's say um there's drugs that are called beta blockers. Um, they're used for either for high blood pressure or they're used to slow your heart rate down. And so all these drugs, they end in LOL, metoprolol, labetalol, uh, albuterol, um, uh, nabivalol, natalol. So you can, when you see that LOL at the end of the drug name, you should automatically think, okay, that's a beta blocker. And so little things like that help you memorize. Uh, things like that. And then the same thing goes for, uh, let's say, side, side, side effects. Um, we have little tricks. You know, one of the funniest ones that, that I like to uh, think about, I like telling uh, people about, is for drugs are called anticholinergic drugs. Um, and what basically they do is they dry out uh, your body, kind of. And uh, Benadryl is one of these drugs. And so they, they dry out like your saliva and and they kind of stop you from urinating um, and stuff like that. And so one of the tricks we use to remember the side effects for these drugs is can't see, can't spit, 
So it dries out the, the, the lubricant you have in your eyes. So it kind of gives you a blurred vision, dries out your saliva. So can't see, can't spit, and then um, can't pee, and then can't, and I can't say that last word because it's not appropriate. But, um, uh, you know, little things like that, you know, helps us, uh, you know, memorize these, these tricks. Um, so it, it's, it's not the hardest thing in the world. It really isn't. Um, and then when you're seeing them all the time, especially when you work retail, um, if you become a technician or stuff like that, you see these drugs all day, every day. Um, so it, it just, it gets burned in your mind and it's kind of like riding a bike. You never forget it at some point, but don't get me wrong. There's times where a patient will call me. You know, I've been in school for two years already. A patient will call me and they say, you know, what's this drug for? And I, I can I put you on hold and I got to ask the pharmacist because I'm not trained enough yet, you know, but with time, with time, it comes with time, it comes. You're never going to, you're never going to know it all. Um, and another, another important aspect is um, there's so many drugs coming out all the time. That drug I, I mentioned earlier that the Idaru Sizuzumab, that drug literally just came out last Friday. Um, so you have to be um, ready to always be learning. You the you're never going to stop learning in pharmacy. And to me, that's pretty awesome because I know a lot of old pharmacists that they're still as sharp as a nail because all their life, you know, they had to work their brain to stay up, to keep up with all the latest info. And so um, you, you have to enjoy learning. Trust me, in high school, I hated learning. I wanted to quit school. I was done already. Even right now, I'm tired of school, but I do enjoy learning. It's the studying, I guess, that that kind of like, oh, you know, I wish I didn't have to study, but I, I enjoy going home the next week and saying, hey, mom, did you know this? You know, I, I enjoy being able to know more every day, um, I guess I, I would say. Well, we're coming close to our time that we're going to stop. Um, I want to thank students for um, asking great questions and um, giving your attention, um, and we hope to see you again on the next Cyber Mentoring. We'll be sending out the information. Are there any last questions out there? We'll give them a minute to type in. They have a question about synthetic drugs. Oh, okay. Um, see, I'm in pharmacy school. We, we don't really talk about anything that's not used medicinally. Um, cocaine, I can tell you about. Believe it or not, cocaine has been used in hospitals. Um, but as opposed to like marijuana stuff like that in the state of Texas, that's not used medicinally. Um, so um, I can't vouch very much for that. All I can tell you is that every drug is bad. There's no such thing as a good drug, even the ones that we prescribe to you or that are prescribed to you. And so when you have these drugs that, you know, like the spice or that K2 and stuff like that, and you're seeing all these bad things that, that people are experiencing from that, like that's 10,000 times worse than these drugs that we're giving to you. So if little things like that are causing like that, you can imagine internally you know, how they're affecting your brain cells, your heart cells, things like that. It's ex these drugs are extremely toxic um, to the body. And so, I mean, I, I, I don't know specifics about synthetic drugs, but all I can tell you is there's no such thing as a good drug, you know, whether it's prescribed or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Are there any more questions? No thank, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Portillo. I see you've been here all day, and I really appreciate it. I think it's a lot. I think it's a good opportunity for the kids to learn things in a new and different way. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Garcia. <laughs>